Thank you for coming. I'm flattered that you would be here, especially knowing that a couple of you have heard me blab about this a lot in the past. Uh, for those that uh, haven't, I hope you enjoy tonight's meeting. Um, tonight, I'm going to kind of go through a little bit of uh, background on myself and how I came to love air shows and, and photog photographing them. Um, and then I'm going to talk a little bit about how to prepare and what to bring to an air show. And then a little bit about setting your camera and technique. And then we'll we'll take a look at some examples um, towards the uh, towards the end. So that's kind of my plan for tonight. With that, um, I'm going to start by just talking a little bit about air shows in general. There's over 23 million people in the world every year, assuming you don't have COVID, that attend uh, approximately 400 large and small air shows all over the world, 10 million in the USA, uh, at about 300 different shows, uh, all the way again from very, very small uh, to what I'd call Cambrio being kind of a small medium all the way up to uh, huge, huge events. Um, it's it, it has become probably the most popular event photography for photographers in the country, at least at the level of event that it is. And there's a thought that probably the reason for that is that there's probably no other event of this kind, barring youth youth sports or something like that, where a beginning level photographer. Uh, and pro level photographers are all have equal access, so to speak, to uh, capture the action from the best locations on site. So I'll attend an air show on one side of me will be a rookie. On the other side of me might be a pro photographer that uh, makes his living shooting them and both have exactly the same opportunities. And that's part of what I think makes us in addition to the excitement, the color, all of the other stuff that goes on at air show, I think that's what makes it so popular with photography. Uh, I'd like to kind of share with you a little bit of my background and um, how I got there in terms of both photography and uh, and airplanes. So uh, for some, this did this to me earlier. So this is a picture my dad took in 1936. And he was a very serious photographer. He was an engineer and he was also a private pilot. And the things he liked to photograph most were machinery, people at work, and those types of things, being an engineer. He started shooting probably as best I can determine. I've got photographs going back into the 20s, um, very prolific in the 30s and 40s and 50s. And I've got, ironically, my mother also um, was what I would characterize as a serious travel and landscape photographer. And uh, so they had a very mutual interest in it. My mother, I have uh, literally thousands of pictures she took in the, uh, in the 20s. And I think she kind of let my dad take over in the 30s and 40s. This shot is one of Lady Summers. It was a, a Canadian uh, steamship that was, uh, again, he shot this in 1936. Uh, the Germans sank it. Uh, in 1939, a German U-boat. Um, this is a shot he took that I, I've always kind of loved because it was taken somewhere in the early 30s. And, and you think about technically taking a shot like this, pretty difficult uh, taking it uh, with a camera alone, let alone the darkroom work uh, when you had such bright uh, highlights and deep shadows and to retain as much detail as they did. Um, so I, I just, this is one of my favorites of his shots. I've got a lot of favorites and literally hundreds of them, but uh, thought I would show this one because I think technically it's a great photograph. Uh, he put the camera in my hand, probably at about, I don't know, six or eight years old and introduced me to the magic that takes place in a dark room. And that really was the genesis of my love of photography that's, uh, that I've had for a good uh, 65 years plus. Um, this is in 1964 when I was a fresh faced kid in the Navy. I uh, put down out of boot camp that uh, 
you know, they, they have what they call your dream sheet. You put down uh, what you'd like to be assigned to with little hopes that you're going to get there. So I thought being on a big ship would be more fun. And I put down either a battleship or a uh, aircraft carrier out of San Diego. And of course, what they did was they assigned me to an aviation squadron in Lemoore, California, up near Fresno, that went aboard a aircraft carrier. So in a roundabout way, I got my, uh, my dream sheet answered. And uh, this is a picture of me on one of our squadron's airplanes. And at the time, I was what was called a yeoman striker. I was uh, going to be a fellow that took care of, uh, well, basically, it was, uh, was going to be a, a clerk taking care of officers' records, a job that I didn't do very well because while I was pretty good, fast typist, I tended to make a lot of errors. And when it came to officers' records, we had to make six carbon copies of each page and they had to be perfect. They could not have one mistake. And uh, frankly, I was not very good at doing that. And I didn't much like being down in the bowels of the ship to begin with. So a few months later, uh, somewhere off the coast of Vietnam, I was sent to the flight deck to help load bombs and load guns on the squadron's airplanes. And uh, that was, I, I rapidly fell in love with what may be one of the most dangerous jobs in the Navy on uh, working in one of the uh, most dangerous places, which is the flight deck. But I absolutely loved it. and. Uh, at the end, the end of the year, um, that's me in the middle of this group of Aviation Ordnance Brothers. Um, the, that rating in the Navy, some say next to the SEALs is probably the, the greatest brotherhood uh, there is in the Navy. And some of those guys are still friends that I stay in touch with uh, uh, all this time down in the lower left, uh, the in the front row, the second guy in is Charles Bailey. And if any of you follow me on Facebook, you'll see Charles occasionally make comments or uh, uh, like some of my images. The guy to the right of him um, was a guy I went ashore with in Yokosuka, Japan, a little tiny, tiny town off the coast that we went to for some unknown reason that convinced me that uh, to get a fly tattooed on my big toe after getting me thoroughly drunk. So I still have that little fly that is a remembrance of him and uh, the dirty deed he did to me. But uh, anyway, the uh, plane is one of our squadron's A-1 Sky Raiders, which was a Vietnam workhorse. Uh, it flew, it was, uh, uh, probably the favorite plane of any guy on the ground because it could stay in the air forever and uh, cover, cover them with uh, either uh, bombs or guns and uh, was really a workhorse in that regard. It also was probably did most of the heavy bombing in North Vietnam, North, excuse me, North Vietnam, um, other than the B-52. So it was an attack bomber and it was, uh, uh, a rescue uh, strafer in the south. And it was actually the airplane that shot down the first two MiGs in Vietnam. Uh, it was sister squadron on one of the other ships that was over there at the same time as us. And they shot down two MiGs. Our squadron lost uh, just about, well, we lost three pilots uh, all within a matter of a few weeks during uh, actually about the time this picture was taken. Uh, when uh, the heavy bombing of the North was ordered and we lost three pilots and we had 37 airplanes in total. And we came back with uh, only uh, a handful that were really uh, service ready. Um, one of the problems with the A6 was it wasn't an all weather plane. So it could only fly in relatively good weather. So when we got back, <clears throat> excuse me, the squadron transitioned to what was then the brand new A6 Intruder. And uh, I took one look at that with an 18,000 pound payload of bombs and decided that I no longer wanted to be lifting bombs by hand overhead on that beast and studied like crazy 
to get accepted into the first school to be trained as a troubleshooter in the electronics warfare system, uh, ordnance system in that airplane. And I spent the rest of my time in the Navy uh, working the mid-shift from 12 o'clock at night until eight o'clock in the morning, uh, tracing circuits and replacing black boxes and uh, fixing the weapon system in that plane. So that's kind of uh, my background and what got me so interested in airplanes and photography and what have you. So let's move on to, uh, to air shows. And the first thing I kind of want to cover is a uh, preparation checklist before you ever uh, uh, start going, you, know, you need to do some planning. And it will really help you uh, make a long five, eight hour day comfortable and successful. And that's one thing about air shows versus most other events is uh, they tend to last a full day rather than a football game where you might go for a few hours. And generally you're traveling there and what you don't wanna do is uh, get caught uh, unexpectedly uh, going through the gate and having the uh, person at the gate say, oh, you can't do this or you can't do that. So the very first thing I suggest that you do on my checklist is check the website for options and or restrictions that may be in place for that air show. And there are some that are a little bit different right now, um, now that we're opening them back up during this period of COVID that uh, you really should take a look at. Uh, after the 9-11, uh, for example, uh, you couldn't take a bottle of water in with you, uh, no liquids. And they inspect your bags pretty thoroughly as you come through the gate. So. Be sure and read the website, uh, some of the pages that you probably just skip over. Make sure you, you're well informed before you go. The uh, next thing is to always purchase tickets online in advance. Right now, most of the shows are going to require them, um, period. There's gonna be no ticket sales at the front gate. If you don't have a ticket when you get there, you're not gonna get in at all. Um, in other times, generally, uh, there's some pretty nice discounts offered uh, if you buy them online in advance. And basically, by buying them in advance, you avoid some long lines. I mean, I can uh, tell you I've been to the Cambrio Air Show where there's been a line just to buy the tickets that were was 20 minutes or more long. And then uh, you went from there into the line through the gate and stood for another 20 more minutes or so. So uh, get the tickets in advance online. And the other thing about doing that is some of the options that they have, and a lot of people don't realize that uh, some of those options are there, sell out very, very early. For example, preferred parking. And I always recommend preferred parking. The reason being that you're going to probably need completely different equipment for the morning versus the afternoon performances. And we'll talk a little bit about you know, the morning and shooting static displays and uh, street photography, so to speak, and all the stuff that you can do versus the afternoon as we get more into my presentation. But what I do is I leave my equipment in my car and uh, for the afternoon, I take in my lightweight equipment in the morning and then I exchange it uh, just before the afternoon performances uh, start getting going. Uh, in Camrio, if you are in general parking, you're probably going to be ferried to the show uh, via a tractor hauling a, a trailer. Uh, if you go down to the Plains of Fame in Chino, uh, even if you have preferred parking, you still have to take a shuttle. And if you don't have preferred parking, you're going to be way, way out with one shuttle, uh, followed by a second shuttle to get to the gate. So. Uh, definitely a good option. This year I noticed at Camarillo that they don't even show preferred parking as an option until you get to the point where you're checking out. So keep a, keep a lookout for it. Thanks to Roy for that because I was not even aware of it. Uh, the other thing that oftentimes uh, air shows will offer is early access where you can go out and shoot on the flight line. Uh, you can get out there at sunrise and get some really incredible pictures of the uh, Airplanes lined up with the sunrise in the background, um, and the crowds are obviously not there, which allows you to plunk down your chair and get your pretty much your pick a place to sit. 
Uh, I know the Plains of Fame down in uh, Chino offers early access um, and there's some options for it or have been some options for it at the LA Air Show out in uh, uh, Lancaster in the past. I'm not sure whether they're gonna be doing that this year or not. Uh, rehearsal day is a lot of fun. LA Air Show, uh, at least in the past, has offered tickets for the rehearsal day. And of course, you, again, you don't have all the crowds. They probably sell maybe 50 or 100 tickets. So you've got uh, the opportunity pretty much to shoot a lot of the static displays without a lot of people around them, which is always one of the challenges. And uh, again, usually you're let in a little bit early. Uh, so uh, th that's a great, great option. Lancaster, I've always gone out for rehearsal day, uh, followed by uh, the show on Saturdays, rehearsal day being Friday, of course. Uh, photo tour is something that the LA Air Show has offered. I'm hoping they will in the future. I know the guy that has run it in the past and I've been talking to him about whether they're going to uh, do it again and they are in negotiations on it. And basically what photo tour does is it allows you early access and they allows there's a tent where you can go get shade and they they have beverages available for you and snacks all day and they feed you a nice lunch and then there are photo pits strategically located around the airfield that you can rotate around and shoot from so uh, the photo tour is usually uh, well worth it uh, the photo tour generally is not, it's, it's very obscure because they sell such a limited number of tickets. Usually I think it's around 50, 50 photo tour tickets. So you really have to search the website uh, to find that particular option. Um, and then there's a VIP lounge. Um, I've taken advantage of that at the Point Magoo show. I'll be taking advantage of that at the upcoming Camarillo show. And that's kind of a fancy schmancy tent that uh, happens to be located right on the, the uh, center line of the show, which is probably the best place for shooting, which I'll talk about a little bit later on. And they feed you a rather elaborate lunch, beverages all day, wine and beer. You have nice tables to sit at, uh, big tent to give you shade. And um, it's kind of a luxury, plus you get preferred parking. And what I found is it's a little more expensive. It's about $130, I think it was, at uh, Camarillo. But by the time I add up the general admission ticket and the preferred parking and buying lunch there, which is usually ridiculously expensive, and junk food and water or whatever else, um, I'm really not spending that much more to be uh, treated very well in the VIP lounge, so something to consider. I know Camryo has already sold out both days on it uh, because it's a very, very limited number of people that get in. Um, shows on military bases, this is something to keep in mind, shows on military bases are always free. Um, some of the options above are offered. Uh, at a cost, but uh, military base shows, uh, for example, uh, Magoo and what have you are, are always free. Avoid the grandstands has kind of, kind of been my, my message. Uh, in the earlier years, 20 years ago, uh, usually there was not even a charge for sitting in the grandstands, but the shows weren't as crowded as they are now. And it was a pretty good place to shoot from. Today, they, they, you know, they just jam people in together. And uh, obviously you can't stand and shoot and you'll be blocking the view of the people behind you. So uh, I would avoid the grandstands uh, generally at all costs. Uh, scout the show a day early. Um, I, I've done this out at the LA Air Show. Um, I've done it on, actually not a day early. I did it, I've done it on, gone to the Camarillo show on Saturday. And then I found some spots on the other side over near the freeway where I could uh, shoot uh, on Sunday from a little bit different point of view. I know at this point, the cops of the CHP are trying to close a lot of that down, but I have a feeling on Friday that there may be some opportunities to shoot from there. And it allows you to kind of practice and uh, uh, get a few shots in that you might not otherwise get from the other side. Um, you'll see 
uh, warbirds and some of the uh, military jets and what have you will be flying in on, on Friday in preparation for Saturday. So, so there's some opportunities there. Occasionally, uh, some of the aerobatics people will be practicing and what have you. What to bring? And you guys, I think, are going to laugh and, and wonder why in the world I would put some of these things on, on here. And I won't embarrass any of the people here that have had uh, this uh, happen to them. But I think on the list that I'm about to show you, I think just about every item on it I have lent to people at air shows. The first one being camera bodies and lenses. And yes, um, one of our esteemed photographers uh, drove to Chino and forgot to bring his camera and lenses with him. So uh, he uh, ended up having to shoot with a very foreign body, my Canon 5D Mark IV I lent him for the day. And uh, he learned what a really nice camera is. Um, I always say a minimum and, and proper full frame is, is one of the questions in terms of, uh, of what do you need for lenses. Um, obviously, with a crop, you're going to get one and a half or 1.6 times the field of view. And so you probably get away with uh, a little bit shorter focal length lens. With a full frame camera, you're going to need a longer lens. Um, but there's enough to shoot. I think people worry about it maybe a little too much. I just usually suggest as a bare bones minimum, uh, 200 millimeter lens if you're going to do any kind of aerial shooting. And that's probably pushing it a little bit. Uh, you probably get away with it if you've got a crop body. Uh, but again, that, that's kind of, kind of pushing the limit. You just have to be a little more careful um shooting later in the passes which makes it a little harder to shoot because they're moving uh per perception as they're moving faster the closer they get and it's pretty tough shooting some of the aerobatics and those types of uh activities that are flying as high in the air as they are so ideally i always suggest a uh, 100 400 or 150 600 something like that as the uh, as the ideal lens um, the 150-600s uh, generally are pretty good, but ironically, uh, there are times that uh, I end up zooming out to 100 on some of the closer passes. So again, uh, uh, either, either one, 100-400 or 100-600 are probably uh, two good choices if, they have them, if you have them available, or of course, you can always rent. Uh, preferably, you've got a DSLR with fast focus and burst rate. Although in preparing for this, I uh, look back at some of the early air shows I shot with great success with cameras that were uh, pretty slow focusing that uh, uh, had burst rates that were around three frames a second. And so you can do a nice job uh, with just about any DSLR um, regardless. It just is a heck of a lot easier if, it, uh, if it's a fast focusing lens and body and you can shoot off uh, 10 or 12 frames a second. I have a Mark IV and a 7D Mark II, and the 7D Mark II actually has been my go-to air show camera, not because of the crop body so much as it is the difference between the Mark IV at eight frames a second and the 7D Mark II at 10, and just those two frames uh, really make the day a lot easier. And then what you're gonna want for the morning is wide angle and uh, normal lenses for static displays, loads of opportunities. And, and again, we'll talk a little bit about that later, but uh, as wide angle as you have available. And then uh, generally something like a 24 to 35 millimeter, maybe on the long side uh, for the morning activities. Batteries and flashcards. I cannot tell you how many of both of those I have lent to people especially the uh, folks that are coming to an air show for the first time. It is rare that first timers don't end up uh, shooting twice as many clicks as what they would expect. And uh, so uh, very often I carry a lot of spare batteries and I carry uh, an excessive amount of flashcards um, just to be prepared. I am still a little irritated at uh, a newbie who borrowed my 
very fast C, uh, SD card and lost it and replaced it with a <laughs> with a I think fifteen dollar Costco one, but uh, that's the way it goes. So uh, be prepared with uh, with more batteries and flashcards than you uh, anticipate needing. Uh, goes without saying, sunscreen, hats, wipes, appropriate clothing, especially given what the weather has been. Um, I go home and my wife gets very upset with me. Uh, I usually wear a ball cap and, uh, and I'm not doing that anymore. I'm wearing a uh, wide brim hat because uh, I go home with a uh, pretty sunburned face, even, even using sunscreen. So be very aware that you're going to spend a lot of time out in the sun. A uh, small water cooler with water and snacks, and I say if permitted. Um, it was about two years after 9-11 that uh, that really became problematic, but the last few years of air shows really weren't a problem. Um, obviously, uh, if you can pack a lunch, you're going to save a whole lot more money than going and buying the junk food there that's so overpriced. As far as water, you really need to stay hydrated. And I think it's like three or four dollars a bottle if you buy it there. What I do is I've got a small six pack type cooler and I literally freeze three or four of the bottles uh, the night before. And um, then I have two that are that are chilled when I go and the frozen ones keep the chilled uh, cold for when I want them early on in the show. And usually by the afternoon, the uh, the frozen ones are kind of slushy or for the most part uh, have melted and uh, uh, pretty refreshing and I'm glad to have them. So again, two, two to four frozen bottles, maybe three, along with three uh, cool ones and you'll be glad that you had them. Uh, folding chair with flip top. I call this my air show chair. I got it uh, quite a number of years ago and I think I was the only one there with it. Um, this type of chair allows you, and I use it for all kinds of other things, even though it's kind of affectionately called my airshow chair. And the big advantage of it is that the top there goes down with just a flick of the, uh, of the wrist, so to speak. <clears throat> so you can put it up in the interval between performances and get some shade. And then you can flip it down for the folks behind you that are gonna be upset if you leave it up uh, as the next performance starts. And that's been really a godsend for me and uh, actually one we use a lot when we go to the beach or other venues where we're gonna be out in the sun quite a bit. Uh, or an attachable umbrella, <clears throat> excuse me, but most of the shows are no longer allowing them. I noticed that's one of the things uh, that you'll see on the uh, Cambrio Air Show uh, website. I was kind of surprised because the last Cambrio show I went to there were umbrella, the, you know, the attachable ones that attach to your chair. They were all over the place. And I suspect they might have had some problems that I can anticipate what a couple of them probably were. One is that obviously they're difficult to put up and take down and people were getting pretty irritated about the people in front of them, uh, their view being blocked or if they were photographing from a couple of rows back, dealing with the uh, pole sticking up uh, even though the umbrella was down. So that's one item. And, and I have a feeling that probably, uh, you know, you occasionally will get a blast from the, the props or from jets. And uh, I suspect that those umbrellas probably become a missile uh, and quite dangerous. So uh, anyway, I noted that uh, Camryo is not allowing them. I have a feeling that most other air shows will probably go the same way. Uh, small wagon or cart. Uh, I have, you know, the, the letterbox carts that you can get at, uh, at um, all the, the stationary stores and what have you. I have one of those, except it's commercial grade that I got on, uh, on Amazon. Um, Deborah Saturco's got a great little cart. I get, I get envious of that. But she, every place she goes, uh, she's got this little cart that all of us uh, are kind of jealous over. And I don't think she paid a lot of money for it. Uh, and she hauls around her gear in that cart and it, it really, really comes in handy at, at the shows. Uh, my, little, my little cart I kind of like as a storage box as I'm switching lenses or bodies or what have you when I'm on the flight line shooting. Uh, ditch the tripod or monopod. Uh, unless you are shooting video, in which case uh, you, may, you may want one, but I gotta tell you, you you're gonna have to find the location to shoot from 
um, that may not be the best. Uh, I've got a very good friend that uh, she's retired Air Force. Uh, uh, her name's Tina. She was a member of the Lancaster Club, and she and I used to meet up at air shows all the time. And Tina's about uh, five feet tall and about uh, 80 pounds, 85 pounds, dripping wet, but uh, <clears throat> built to say the least. And she showed up one air show with a 500 millimeter F4 Canon lens with, you know, familiar with that lens, it is gigantic and had it on a monopod. And I said, Tina, you're gonna kill us all. Oh no, oh no. And the first thing I knew was the monopod is swinging around decapitating all of us. But uh, Tina was strong enough to uh, shoot with that 500 millimeter handheld and did a pretty good job of it. But she ditched the, the monopod or tripod. So I wouldn't bother uh, bringing one in uh, the one exception to that, and again, this is one of the advantages of the preferred parking, is uh, if you go for one of the early access uh, options, then you're out shooting the sunrise, you get out there, and it's pitch dark, and that sun starts rising, and uh, yes, you'll find half the photographers that are there will be using their tripods, and uh, again, what they'll do is uh, go back to their car later, uh, switch out and leave the tripod in the car so they're not uh, carrying it around all day long. Tickets. And now that you have to buy them online and you, if you arrive without them, you're not going to get through the gate. Um, that's a biggie. And I hate to admit it that I wasn't an air show, thank God, but I did go to an event and suddenly realized that uh, I'd left the tickets at home. So uh, even if you forget everything else above, at least you want to see the show don't forget your tickets. So that kind of takes care of what to bring. So at every air show, there are one of the things I think that is captivating about, it, about air shows that it's also uh, pretty interesting is that few other venues uh, have so many distinctly different photographic opportunities and challenges. And literally, I think just about everybody in our club would find something out of the air show um, that would be of interest or opportunity to their genre of photography. So first and foremost, in the morning, you've got an opportunity for PJ, uh, abstracts, artistic uh, type of images, ground displays, and people. <clears throat> this is a shot that Larry White took. Uh, I think Larry's with us tonight that I believe uh, he received an award for. Uh, you'll see people dressed in various uniforms and what have you. I, I think this is one of the paratroopers that uh, actually jumped out of the plane. I'm not sure. <clears throat> but lots of opportunities for people and PGA type, type uh, um, pictures. <clears throat> and we'll look at a, at a lot more of those as I get uh, down to some of the illustrations that I have later. Uh, slow shutter panning, uh, which is aerobatics, prop planes, helicopters, and warbirds. And again, we'll talk a little bit more about that. And that's a genre unto itself. It's kind of the uh, elephant in the room. Uh, everything else is, other than artistically, fairly easy. Um, shooting prop planes properly is a, is a challenge. And then you've got the fast high hand coordination of jets and demo teams uh, like the Blue Angels and the Thunderbirds and what have you that uh, move at a blink will go by you. Uh, that is an enormous challenge. So how do you deal with all those? Whoops. Um, first, uh, you start thinking about shutter speeds. And uh, excuse me a second, I want to take a sip here and get a little dry in the mouth. For prop planes, you want to have a blur on the propeller, but you want a sharp image of the airplane. To do that, you're going to uh, need to shoot with a shutter priority someplace between a 60th and a 320th. And generally, uh, the more experience you get, the better you get at doing this. Uh, but you can almost tell the RPMs of the engines, depending on the sound. So you'll get the thump, the thump, the thump, the thump on maybe some of the older warbirds and what have you. And then on some of the uh, aerobatics and what have you, you'll get a zzzz. 
indicating that the prop is spinning at a very, very rapid rate. Obviously, the more rapid rate, the uh, faster shutter you can shoot with. I generally, especially now that I'm getting old and not quite as steady as I used to be, I'm generally shooting most of the warbirds and the prop lanes at somewhere around 160th. Uh, and I will, again, as we get further on in the, I'll be showing some examples. Helicopters are a super challenge. Um, shutter priority somewhere between a 30th and a 100th. So hand-holding at a 30th, to say the least, is, is, uh, is challenging. Uh, jets, um, I shoot aperture priority. This is pretty controversial. Uh, some people will say, you should shoot at shutter priority because you want to be a thousandth or more. Um, what I've found is that, and I may switch my thinking depending given my R5 and how fast at autofocus, but what I've found in the past is if you don't have a really, really fast autofocusing lens and body, oftentimes with these planes moving as quick as they are, they'll move out of the plane of focus uh, on you. So, you know, you might be tracking them, but, but uh, you'll get one end of the plane sharp and the other end out of focus or vice versa. So I've always liked having at least an aperture that is high enough that I've got good solid depth of field. So if my focus isn't keeping up or I got a big body plane or what have you, I uh, don't, don't have the plane run out of my field of focus. That means keeping my ISO high enough that uh, generally I'm shooting at a thousandth or faster for jets. And uh, uh, oftentimes I'll, I'll jack it up even higher than that. Given that most air shows are in very bright light, I don't worry too much about noise and uh, we'll go up to a 16, 100 ISO, something like that, without being too worried about it. So if I'm shooting at aperture priority, say of F9, um, I can usually get the uh, shutter speed jacked up pretty high. Uh, bare minimum, of course, is to use the reciprocal rule, uh, which says that uh, you should be shooting at one over your uh, uh, one over your focal length and uh, We'll talk again about that a little bit more as we go along, but uh, that kind of gets thrown out for the most part with air shows. Panning, which is part of the trick of getting good propeller plane shots with the propeller spinning and the, uh, uh, the plane sharp. And this might be boring for some of you experienced photographers, but uh, I'm always amazed as I observe uh, people hand holding, whether it's uh, this type of photography or landscapes or anything else. Uh, for most of my life, I've been able to pretty much uh, take a hundred millimeter lens and hold it steady at uh, about a 30th of a second using good hold hand holding techniques. Um, I'm not quite as good at 77 years old as I used to be doing that, but uh, it, it comes with uh, good technique. The first thing is to cradle your left hand under the lens, not your, not over the top of the lens. Um, I was recently shooting a mounted shooting event with a very good friend who probably sells more pictures right now than everybody else I know put together. He's a great photographer and I was uh, just blown away by the fact that he had his left hand over the top of the lens, uh, changing, you know, changing the zoom and what have you. And, and I, I would suggest that uh, if you don't think it makes a difference, then take a rock and put it in your hand and hold your arm out and, and just see how steady you can keep your hand. Not to mention uh, what you're doing is you're balancing the lens and the body uh, together to make it uh, a steadier platform. Uh, second thing is a uh, soft right hand on the grip. I see people giving the grip a death grip and of course, uh, if you hold something tight enough, your hand is going to shake. Uh, third is the elbows down and tucked in. Again, uh, I uh, kind of laugh at the air shows when I see people shooting, looking like they're ready to take off. And uh, getting those elbows down, tucked into your side again, provides a, uh, a better platform to be shooting from. 
uh, feet spread out one in front of the other. I'll often see people with them side by side. And uh, one of the things I suggest, uh, not only for this particular part of it, but for all of it, is uh, think about somebody handing you a shotgun that you know is going to have a big recoil. Uh, would you have your feet out side by side or would you have one behind the other? Wouldn't you have your elbows down and tucked in? Um, what have you? So uh, think about those things. Uh, breathe. I was always taught to breathe out. I think there's uh, theories that you should be breathing in and out, but holding your breath physiologically uh, will not help you be steady. So I tend to take a brief breath and I just let out the air very gently as I start to shoot. And then squeeze the shutter, don't push. Uh, for those with that bad habit, myself uh, being kind of one of them, that's one of the advantages of shooting in a burst mode is that uh, oftentimes you'll find the, uh, especially with shooting slow shutter like these uh, shots, uh, what so often you'll find is that first shot uh, will be blurry and then the second or third shot will be good because it's that first shot you press that shutter and that tends to push the uh, camera down, blur the image, and then the second or third shot you are stabilized. Uh, again, the reciprocal rule, you can just about throw out the door at air shows. Obviously, with uh, Prop plane, slower is better, uh, throw it out there. And with jets and what have you, uh, no reason not to uh, exceed the reciprocal rule as best you can, depending on the light that you're in. Once you've got those good basic hand-holding techniques down, follow them with a smooth, steady motion, uh, which means one, locate and lock your focus on your subject in the viewfinder early on. And we'll talk about the best places to be located uh, shooting in an air show, which is a little bit controversial. But especially if you're newer to shooting an air show, what you want to do is uh, give yourself as much room to see the plane coming in the distance, kind of get locked in on it and prepare to shoot early because uh, it's that eye-hand coordination of finding the plane in the viewfinder that is half the trick. And if you're, if you're newer at doing it, um, that can be a challenge. The earlier you start, the easier it is. If you're used to shooting birds in flight, you'll uh, find this uh, shooting airplanes fairly easy in that regard, or vice versa. If when you're used to uh, shooting air shows, you'll find that your bird in flight photography will suddenly get a little bit better. Uh, turn your torso, not your arms. And this can be a little bit tough uh, because what you're doing is you start shooting with the plane way down the field. And as it comes towards you, obviously you are, you're, you're turning your torso, which says that how do you plant that foot one in front of the other and manage to do that? So what I try to do is I kind of try to uh, position myself at about a 45 degree angle to the airstrip. And uh, so I'm starting out shooting somewhat to the side. And as it comes, I'm passing my, my legs and uh, it, it helps balance. And again, turning the torso and not your arms keeps your, uh, keeps your arms tucked down into your side and steady. And then I always suggest overframing slightly. I've uh, uh, probably deleted countless uh, images of uh, planes with uh, the tail chopped off or the front of the plane slightly chopped off. And you want to leave room for the plane to fly into. You want more space in front of it than behind it. Uh, as you get into competition, you know, that's always one of the things the judges kind of focus on is any moving object. You want, it, uh, you want it to have space and room to move into, whether it's an airplane or a runner or uh, what have you. Then prepare for the change in relative distance. And I spoke to this a second ago, but uh, uh, some of you knowing your background in science and what have you can probably uh, more scientifically explain it. But obviously uh, shooting a fast moving airplane, 
the further out it is, the perception of speed and motion uh, is much slower than it is as it's coming and passing you. So I've generally got my hand on that zoom ring kind of located uh, so that I can turn it easily as the plane approaches and I can get wider and wider and wider. Again, a reason maybe to overframe a little bit, but, but be prepared for that, uh, that dramatic change from a plane at the end of the airfield to all of a sudden coming by you lickety split. And then I think I've talked quite a bit about uh, shooting and bursts and the reason for doing them. Basic camera settings, um, AI servo, of course, or AFC or continuous or whatever your particular brand calls for, um, because you're going to cut a lock focus and you're going to want to track uh, that airplane as it comes down the field. Um, and uh, the better your camera is at doing that, probably the more success you will have. Uh, focus point selection versus zone. And you'll hear uh, people advocate for just about every option there is. Uh, I generally, when I'm shooting, will shoot with a cluster of uh, five focus points, one in the middle surrounded by four. Um, there are those that say, well, you know, why not have more focus points? And then there are those that say, well, why not just plain old use a zone focus system that your camera's built to do? Because an airplane in the sky has good separation from itself and the broad bluer sky. The problem I have with that is that occasionally you'll have more than one airplane close to each other um, and you'll have smoke or you'll have other things in the skies that can really confuse a zone system. So uh, that's not something I would generally use, but again, I hear people advocating it. So, uh, you know, single point, um, five points, eight points, nine points, whatever, uh, shoot with what you are comfortable with in terms of uh, your focus point selection. And then, of course, now the newer, some of the newer cameras, the Sony's, my R5 are absolutely incredible in terms of subject tracking, you know, eye tracking, uh, people tracking, uh, animal tracking, what have you. I am just itching to try that on an air show. So if you've got a Sony or R5 or R6 or something that's got a good tracking system, uh, be curious to know how you've done and I will be testing it thoroughly when I get to uh, the Camarillo show. Uh, back button focus, uh, people swear by it. I'm not gonna talk a lot about it. It's something I've just never managed to uh, acclimate myself to, but uh, I can tell you that probably 90% of uh, people I know that shoot air shows or action or what have you use back button focus. So if you're not familiar, look up the term and look up uh, how to use it with your camera. Image stabilization or vibration reduction. Um, I have, especially helicopters, it's almost, I mean, when you're shooting at a 30th of a second on a moving object, and of course, helicopters usually are not moving that fast. Uh, very often you're shooting them hovering and image stabilization, vibration reduction, really helps uh, when you're down at a 30th or a 60th of a second and you're shooting with a 300 millimeter or a 400 millimeter lens. Um, I generally personally leave image stabilization on. Uh, Canon lenses um, are actually some of them pretty good at switching from, uh, from a panning mode to a regular mode. Uh, I don't necessarily rely on it, but for, and I'll, and I'll switch between IS-1 and IS-2. Uh, I know, you know a lot of the other lenses now have three, three, three settings. One is uh, vertical horizontal, the other is horizontal panning, and the other, which I don't particularly recommend, uh, leaves the image stabilization off until you actually click the shutter. That's three. Um, that's pretty good if you want to save your batteries, but I've not found that it works very well uh, shooting moving airplanes. So really my technique, and it's where I get most of my good prop blur 
and solid uh, pictures of the airplanes is to have it in IS-1. And uh, when you think about it, the, the plane's really moving almost straight at you from a long distance away. And it's really very slow until it gets, uh, oh, maybe uh, 100 yards in front of you and comes by. And even then, I'll very often get pretty solid pictures uh, using the, uh, both the vertical and horizontal. Uh, occasionally, it will drive the image stabilization a little bit crazy if I'm panning really, really quick. <clears throat> but for all the good shots I get from further down the airfield, uh, it's that much better. I think if I was shooting with a 200 millimeter lens um, or shorter, shorter lens, I probably would shoot in the panning mode because the planes are going to be a lot closer to you and moving by you, so to speak, much faster. Um, the burst mode, obviously, uh, Generally, the, the quickest you can, uh, can find. Uh, I've played with 20 frames a second on my R5. I don't think I want to use that because uh, in playing with it, I filled the large card in about five minutes. Um, actually, looking back at the image preparing for tonight that I shot 20 years ago with cameras that were three frames a second, I did just fine. Um, again, it just makes it easier. Um, uh, again, my, my 7D Mark II, I've been shooting at 10 frames a second um, in short bursts, so I'm usually not shooting 10, 10 images all at once, but uh, it's that, that quick burst that, uh, where the second or third frame will often be the best, uh, the best shots. Uh, evaluative or partial metering, again, I don't know on this. I just leave my cameras on evaluative. Um, I, I have actually friends that shoot with spot metering. Uh, they tell me with the Blue Angels and uh, the Thunderbirds, which are exactly opposites, of course, the Thunderbirds being white, the Blue Angels being dark blue. Uh, they tell me that, uh, you know, you can't get a good image if you're not spot metering on either that white or that blue. And I, uh, I, I just think that's kind of nonsense. And uh, I found that as I go to partial metering or spot, I just get crazy results that uh, are really inconsistent. So I use a evaluative and then uh, occasionally I need to adjust in post, but uh, that, that tends to work best for me. So let's talk about some of the different genre that you're gonna be shooting or look at some examples. And of course the PJ abstract, close up artistic, is generally in the AM before the flight demos. The flight demos will usually start about 12.30 or one o'clock. The gates usually open about nine. What you wanna do is race to get your chair locked into a good spot on the flight line. And then uh, the best thing is to have a buddy system where you can take turns uh, guarding your equipment that you don't wanna carry around with you and then have a good uh, three hours of uh, walking around, having fun, shooting people that it's static displays, uh, doing the PJ. Uh, it's almost like street photography. Um, and again, static displays people. Um, what you want is a fairly full range of focal lengths. Um, actually somewhere between 16 and uh, 200 millimeters is uh, what I would probably be carrying around with me. And uh, so that, probably three different lenses, maybe a couple different lenses, depends on what you got in the bag. But uh, this, this was shot, I think with my 1635, and just to get that kind of perspective, um, a, a lot of what you would do, I would think would be probably between the 24 and, and 70 range. So if you just had one lens you had to pick and wanted to go lightweight, um, that would be the effective uh, focal length that I would probably choose. Try different angles and perspectives, especially shooting airplanes. Uh, it's a lot of fun. You know, the big bulbous noses on planes are very sharp ones like this. Get low, uh, get wide, uh, have fun. Look for close ups, details, and stories. Uh, be creative. And here's an example again of uh, people in PJ. Another shot of Larry's that I always really thought was just a great shot. 
and uh, tons of these kinds of opportunities for shooting, shooting people in various uniforms and uh, what have you. Uh, this is one of my all-time favorites that was done by a guy that a lot of you know, Daryl Preeb, and he calls it, wow, she's hot. And I, I just thought this is just an absolutely fantastic PJ picture. Uh, so you'll, you'll see stuff like this, especially the kids uh, can be a lot of fun uh, looking at the airplanes and what have you. So for you street guys, uh, tons of opportunities for that type of photography. Here's an example of, uh, of early morning shooting. This is out at the LA Air Show and, and the sunrises out there are absolutely fantastic. And so this is Wee Willie 2, it's a P-51. I shot this with a, a fairly normal lens, I think a 24 millimeter uh, right at sunrise. Uh, tons of opportunities if you like this kind of thing, I love it, of close-ups and abstracts. This is the uh, exhaust ports on a P-51 Mustang. And uh, this is probably the, the thing I enjoy shooting the most in terms of the static displays. This is a B8 Bearcat. And, and what was kind of fun with this was the uh, nose of the plane was uh, slightly outside the hangar. So I managed to have a really nice dark background and well-lit foreground. and. Uh, that red in the, in the uh, propeller is a little bit like the uh, judge we have that always says, where's the, where's the girl in the red bikini? Where's that point of interest? And that, that kind of grabs your eye, takes you in. Again, this is Skidoo, a P-38 Lightning, uh, using a normal lens at sunrise out of the LA Air Show. Uh, this is at Chino at the uh, Plains of Fame. And, uh, you really get a chance to, I mean, there are an unbelievable number of airplanes at that show. That, if you just take the Camry Air show in terms of warbirds and triple or quadruple it, uh, that's what you'll have out at, uh, out at uh, Chino. Um, you won't have um, quite so much of the military jets or you won't, and you'll never see the Blue Angels or Thunderbirds there, but a fantastic lineup of warbirds and uh, with the early access, you can walk up and get very, very close to them and uh, a lot, a lot of great opportunities. Uh, here's Sem for Fee. Uh, this is actually owned by the uh, Commemorative Air Force at the, uh, the, the volunteer uh, group at Camrio that restores planes. It's a B-25 that was uh, dressed as a uh, <coughs> Marine. PBJ1J Mitchell, and uh, they always fly the flags, and I think they really make some nice drama. So this is just taken on the ground uh, in the morning. A lot of action out the LA Air Show and uh, Magoo and shows like that, um, especially shooting ground crews out working and preparing the planes. Again, make great photojournalistic pictures. Uh, occasionally you'll get, this is a Britling company. It's a, uh, this is a Swiss luxury watchmaker. Uh, their specialty is precision made chronometers uh, for aviation. And that plane is part of their, so to speak, Blue Angels type demonstration team. They put that on as a private company and travel around the world. So I thought this was kind of cool between their Bentley parked next to their airplane and a fun shot for uh, uh, early morning. In a lot of the shows, we'll have a car show in conjunction with the air show. Uh, that's the case at uh, Camrio, uh, usually a pretty big car show. So for folks that are into that, and then they have, uh, on, you're on the flight line in the afternoon, they'll have a parade of the cars that come down uh, in front of you. So. Uh, lots of opportunities uh, for that type of photography. Parachutes. Um, it, it, they will almost universally begin the afternoon event with the Star Spangled Banner. And uh, usually it's a military precision jumping team. Um, and, and, then, and then there'll be some other possible parachute uh, activities later. 
Uh, I know at Camrio, they very often have a whole bunch of guys jumping out of a uh, DC-2 in uh, military garb. But uh, what you want for shooting uh, uh, the parachutes is fast shutter. Obviously, you're not worried about the, uh, um, about the propeller anymore. You generally want to shoot in a fairly fast burst because flags can be one of the most difficult thing. If you've got one like this, the flag flags uh, uh, have their own peculiarity in terms of photographing them. And so if you shoot five or six shots of something like this, um, you'll get one or two with the flag ideally positioned. You want to wait, you know, there's a tendency to want to start shooting right away. And I got to tell you, when those guys jump out of the plane, they are pin dots up there. In fact, sometimes I can't even see them with my naked eye. So don't get too anxious to shoot. And, and if you've properly located yourself um, on the uh, runway towards the center, uh, center line, uh, they'll come down almost to you and you'll get your best shots while they're relatively close to the ground. So got to wait until they fill the frame would be my uh, my recommendation. And then a lot of them will have smoke tied to their boots and uh, the smoke will help portray movement. A uh, parachute in the sky without smoke or something to give it context uh, is like a airplane propeller frozen. Uh, looks like uh, the plane is hanging from a string. And the same thing tends to happen with parachutes if you don't have something else to kind of give it context. Aerobatics. Um, your shutter speeds can vary anything from a hundredth to a three twentieth or higher. Again, I listen to that. Zzz, you'll get some. Actually, there's a warbird that does uh, an aerobatic demonstration generally at Camrio, and um, it's a fairly slow rotating prop, so you have to shoot a little bit slower. Um, some of the aerobatics I've shot up at uh, four hundredth or a little higher and still frozen or still gotten the blur on the, on the props. So you really have to kind of just listen to, uh, to that sound and, and adjust accordingly. Uh, this was shot and, and from here on out, we'll have, uh, actually on all these, you'll have the uh, actual sh shutter speed uh, displayed at the bottom of the picture. Uh, this is Vicki Benzing, who you'll see at just about every air show in uh, Southern California. She's amazing. Uh, this was shot at a 400th. <clears throat> Excuse me. Let me get a sip here to the uh, again. Where you start shooting really depends on how long your focal length is, because they'll be little pin dots up in the sky, but they'll come down relatively close to you. I, I initially put the focal length on each one of these images, and let me explain why I took it off. It's basically because. Um, the, a lot of these are crops and some are shot full frame and some are shot on crop bodies. So I suddenly realized as I was sharing my focal length that it, it really wasn't necessarily relative at all to the photo that you're looking at. So um, that, that's the reason that I'm not, not putting them on here. So again, this is shot at a 400th. Um, you, you shoot, when you're shooting aerobatics, and actually probably true of the parachutes too, don't even try to shoot from a standing position. Uh, if you've got a sling back chair, ideally, what you wanna do is you wanna kind of scooch down and, and lay back as much as you can and shoot from that position with your head pointed, pointed up. Um, I can tell you if you're shooting from a standing position, you're going to have a crook in your neck that night. You won't believe because you're almost shooting straight up. Um, and, it's, and it's very uncomfortable and it's very, very tiring. So if you just shoot laying down and you can almost rest the, uh, the viewfinder on your, on your face, uh, you'll find it's a whole lot easier and you'll find that you'll get uh, a lot steadier, uh, sharper images also because it's uh, a much easier hand-holding position when you're, again, shooting... Uh, vertically up into the sky. Uh, the aerobatics for sure. In fact, 
I often put my camera away when I, when there's somebody performing aerobatics that isn't blowing smoke <clears throat> because uh, the planes just have no context. Uh, I mean, you wouldn't know whether I turned the picture upside down or right side up or sideways in Photoshop without the smoke. It uh, provides a great leading line, uh, context to the photo, uh, kind of excitement. Uh, I, I just really believe when you're shooting aerobatics, uh, smoke is almost a must have. Um, I, I mentioned before, they almost go from a speck in the sky uh, to very close up. This is a shot of the Red Bull team uh, at 160th. And uh, that, if I had to pick one shot tonight that had just about the most perfect uh, uh, blur on the prop, uh, this one might be at, uh, sir would be in, in contention. So Red Bull, as you money, probably most of you are aware, sponsors a lot of things. So they have a whole slew of, uh, of air performance type. They, they race it uh, in Las Vegas, the P-51s, they perform aerobatics in the show. And there's a Red Bull helicopter, which is the first helicopter in the world to actually perform upside down. A uh, very unique feat. The guy that flew it retired a few years ago, but I am led to believe that maybe the Red Bull helicopter is going to be back at Camarillo this year. Hope it is. Uh, this is the Gene Susi, who's kind of famous for the uh, wing walkers and uh, really puts on a good show. And this was shot at a 200th. Notice one nice thing about uh, shooting a passing plane like this, uh, where it's just basically horizontal to you, is you don't really, you really can't tell whether that fella's blurred or not blurred. It is, but uh, you, you don't have to worry so much about the feller blur if you can get it perfectly uh, lined up with you to the side. The benefit of shooting at a 200th in this case is notice the background blur. <clears throat> so the slow shutter in this case really was enhanced with the, uh, the blur of the background with the panning. He's going by me pretty fast. This is Skip Stewart. I just, I love showing this. It's just the first time I saw him do this, I about died. I, I just, I thought he was crashing. And he literally goes down the runway uh, with his plane at that altitude and at that angle and flies the plane sideways, uh, sideways down the runway. By the way, while I'm thinking of it, uh, used to drive me crazy. I like keeping track of what planes they were and who was flying them and found that to be pretty difficult. So uh, what I've come to do is I, I take the program and uh, it usually lists all the performers in relative order, not always but I will make sure that my camera is set to the proper time. And then when a performer comes up uh, in the afternoon, what I'll do is write the time next to that particular performer's name and what have you. And then when I get home, I can uh, pretty much tell who it was and what kind of plane it was and what have you. Uh, Sammy Mason, another great, great uh, air show guy. This is at a 400th. So you see uh, my shutter speed has been moving up a little bit for the most part on the aerobatics. And you can see where the smoke acts is such a uh, nice leading line uh, S-curve into the airplane. Um, just had to put this show up again. This, it, 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 this passings are very, very hard to do. The plane in the foreground was moving past the plane in the fat background uh, at a pretty high rate of speed and, and they were extraordinarily close. Notice that the propeller is blurred in the uh, plane to the rear. You can't really tell the one in the front, um, but I was pretty proud of shooting this at a hundredth of a second and getting both planes sharp. Um, really amazed myself. Warbirds. Um, Warbirds generally will follow the aerobatics. We're kind of taking this in the sequence that usually happens at air shows. And the definition of warbirds at one time was pretty strictly 
World War II and older vintage airplanes. Um, it's being stretched now to include uh, the Korean War. Uh, and uh, so you'll see Korean War, uh, Korean era planes all the way back to uh, World War I type of aircraft in a warbird uh, setting. So this is a Corsair, really famous World War II airplane uh, shot at a 250th. Uh, again, the shutter speeds vary with the uh, prop speed, especially true with Warbirds, you'll get quite a bit of variation. And this is a P-38 Lightning, maybe one of the more popular planes to shoot uh, at a 250th. Uh, the guy that flies that airplane, this is kind of an unusual shot for him. The P-38 is a pretty ugly plane when it is shot at a pure horizontal, like... Uh, was the case of that F-4 Corsair I showed you a few minutes ago because of the two bodies. It's, it's just pretty ugly if you don't have some space between them. For some reason, this guy just doesn't like to wag his wings or uh, give you an angle to shoot at. And it drove me nuts for a long time. I think I took this actually out at uh, Plains of Fame in Chino where he was kind of forced to. There were, I think, three or four other P-38s out there at uh, Camarillo, he's very often the only P-38 to fly there. Uh, they're, they're just a great looking airplane and they, they really have a great history in World War II, but try to get them as they're uh, wagging their wings or at an angle. B-47 Thunderbolt at a 320th. And again, uh, shot like this, you don't need to worry too much about uh, the shutter speed because the uh, Propellers are vertical to you and don't need to worry about that. <clears throat> this is a MiG-17 and you can see I cranked the shutter speed up to uh, 2,500 and probably needed no more than a thousandth on that. Typically for, for Warbird jets, I'm looking at about a 320th to a thousandth. Um, the MiG will move pretty fast but uh, nothing close to what uh, you're gonna see an F-18 or something like that fly by. And so you don't really need that fast, but it can't hurt. Um, I don't think you're seeing any noise or anything in this. I'm not sure what ISO is at, but uh, 2,500 just made it that much better and that much sharper. Uh, B-25 Mitchell at 160th. <clears throat> probably a little bit. I probably could have stood to be just slightly slower on that, maybe 125th, and I might have had a nicer blur. And incidentally, what you got to be a little bit careful of with prop planes is that you don't go too slow uh, because you can literally make the propellers disappear. Um, I'm noticing, you see the orange banding on the outside of that prop. Uh, a little bit slower and what I might have gotten was a circular orange band, which can look pretty cool. But if you've got a solid color propeller and you, and you drop down to uh, a 60th, what you might do is lose the propellers altogether. Uh, Mitsubishi Zero, uh, this is at a 125th. And you can see that at that shutter speed, I'm actually starting to lose the prop on the lower part of the plane there. It's just blurred out, completely gone, or just about completely gone. You see a little bit of a shadow of it. So I, I probably could have been at about 160th on that and been fine. Uh, Canada, Canada Air, uh, CT-133, Silver Star at 1,000. And uh, here is the advantage of going a little bit slower as you can see how that guy's come by very, very fast. And I'm blurring out the background slightly being down at a thousand. If I was up at a 2,500, then uh, the background would probably be uh, just solid in focus. And occasionally you'll get groups of planes. Uh, so these are Texan SNJs and shot at 160th, fairly slow prop rotation. Um, one of the frustrating things to shoot with warbirds is what they call legacy flights. And a lot of times they'll end up at the end of a show at a show like the LA Air Show 
Um, they have a legacy flight. Uh, occasionally, I think they've had them at Camrio. Uh, and I know they have them at Chino. And what they do is they fly Warbirds along with new modern jets. So you'll see, uh, see modern jets along with uh, um, Warbirds. And then it's a decision of how do you deal with the shutter speed. Generally speaking, what you're going to want to do is uh, shoot at a speed for the uh, propeller planes because the jets are going to slow down to the uh, speed of the prop planes anyway. <clears throat> the jets are going to be barely hanging in the air and the prop planes are going to be going as fast as they possibly can. Helicopters. This is the Red Bull, uh, only airplane in the world to fly in an air show upside down. Uh, very cool watching this guy perform. And this was shot at a 80th of a second. Uh, the one thing you've got to be kind of cautious of with, with uh, helicopters is the, the rotor speed on the tail rotor is much, much faster than it is on the main rotor. <clears throat> so it's not unusual to see the tail rotor blur out completely be gone and the front main rotor um, be visible. Uh, so right here at an 80th, this was just about perfect where I've got the uh, tail rotor pretty nicely blurred along with some blur on the uh, main rotor. Uh, just what I just said. Uh, shutter speeds between a 30th and a 100th. Uh, panning requirement generally slow or none. Image stabilization almost a requirement. I think I've talked about all those before. Uh, there's a fire drop of the uh, Ventura County Fire Department at about an 80th. And that's kind of fun because you, you know, blurring not only the props on the uh, helicopter, but kind of getting a little bit of blur of the water drop itself. Uh, this is a Cobra at, a, at its 60th. And uh, there you can see my rear rotor is just about totally gone. And then something like this, this, this I think I've won a couple of awards for, or at least merits. Uh, for PJ, because uh, you you know you can get some of these, especially with the helicopters, where there uh, is some action going on with them, and this was shot at an 80th. Civilian planes you're going to see from antiques to corporate jets. They can be a lot of fun, and basically all the same rules apply to uh, civilian airplanes as due to the warbirds and jets and what have you. <clears throat> this is an experimental plane uh, at a 250th. I think this actually flies out of Santa Paula, I could be mistaken. Citan, uh, Citation Mustang, um, uh, 640th. So I actually was shooting that fairly slow, but he was making a pretty slow pass. And both these airplanes, by the way, this wasn't just a commercial jet coming into Camrio. This was actually flying as part of the air show. I love this plane. This plane uh, flies out of, out of Santa Paula Airport. Used to come to the Camrio show every year. Haven't seen it for the last couple of years. I actually had, uh, had heard that it crashed, but I checked the other day and apparently it is still flying. It is just an absolutely incredibly beautiful airplane. The engine's all chromed and uh, it is just immaculate and fun to shoot. Um, Velocity V-Twin. Great looking home built airplane. Um, some of these uh, planes, like I think the first, the one that was yellow, are generally home built. Uh, this is a 320th. You can see the props in the rear. And then a lot of air shows, you'll just get modern military planes uh, like this F 616. So you'll get jets and props uh, planes uh, together in the uh, military venue. They'll usually fly in the afternoon. If you've got demo teams, they'll fly generally uh, before the demo teams or uh, right after the uh, Warbirds. Uh, here you're about a 1600th. He's obviously got the, the uh, afterburner going and he's lit up and he is moving. So uh, 1600th is probably what I'd want to be about the minimum in terms of shutter speed shooting him. This is a Royal Canadian CF-18, thousandth of a second. They are just incredibly beautiful. They uh, have a demonstration team of a couple of planes that goes around to air shows. And every year they uh, give them a different paint scheme. 
So uh, this was at uh, the Chino Air Show, Planes of Fame, a few years back. And that's the same plane, F-18 Hornet, only the US version. And this is typically <clears throat> how the F-18 shows up at the air shows <laughs> for us in typical gray Navy uh, colors. Uh, Greyhound, which is AKA the COD. Uh, when I was uh, overseas, this was the, uh, probably the most important plane, or at least we felt it was the most important plane um, that uh, arrived at the carrier. Uh, COD refers to carrier on, uh, carrier, carrier on, carrier on delivery. It, it basically brings supplies and mail. So every time the COD arrived, everybody got pretty excited, hoping for uh, letters or packages from at home. That started flying the year that uh, I was overseas, uh, 1965, and is still flying to this day. And you'll see them at a lot of air shows. Uh, put, a, put a big uh, pancake on top of them and they become radar planes. A-10 Warthog. Uh, some say this was the replacement plane, real replacement plane for uh, my A-1 Sky Raiders, the uh, planes I worked with in Vietnam. Um, it's, it's an incredible plane, armor plated. Probably a lot of you have seen this uh, over in the Gulf. It did amazing things. Uh, there's quite a controversy right now going on as to whether to retire it <clears throat> with the idea that the F-35 and F-22 can do the job. But in terms of ground support, uh, there's probably nothing Nothing in the world like the uh, Warthog. You can see the Gatling gun sticking out the nose and I don't know how many thousand rounds a minute that thing fires, but a uh, uh, great plane, the troops love it. And every once in a while, I've only seen this once at an air show, this is the U-2 Blackbird. So occasionally you'll see uh, some pretty exotic planes that uh, you wouldn't otherwise see. Uh, I was pretty excited to see this and the so first thing that comes to mind is uh, was it uh, John Powers that got shot down in Russia years and years ago in a Blackbird. And then you've got the demonstration team, Thunderbirds and uh, Blue Angels and what have you. Uh, this was at a 2000. A lot of people see the, the uh, uh, vapor coming off of the, uh, the airplane and think that it is breaking the sound barrier. Uh, you'll often you'll see a cone surrounding the plane and people say, oh, look at the uh, sound barrier cone. It's uh, the, the vapor is actually created by moisture in the air and compression against the body or wings of the airplane, not, not the sound barrier. So one of the things I learned early on when you're shooting the Blue Angels, the Thunderbirds or fast moving jets is to set up a buddy system. Um, it's uh, oftentimes good to have at least one other guy, maybe two other guys or gals um, spotting together with you because they'll move so darn fast. I mean, they'll be almost invisible to the naked eye and they will be by you and gone before you can even lift your camera. up. So what I generally try to do is get together with one or two other people and we each look a different direction and we'll start calling out as we see the planes coming. And I can tell you, if you have such a system set up, you'll probably double or triple your keeper rate on, um, on some of these demonstration teams. They're just moving so darn fast. Uh, you want a fast shutter. And uh, again, I, I, I shoot at uh, aperture priority and leave myself some, uh, some space in terms of depth of field. But uh, some folks would prefer to just simply lock their shutter speed. So pick your poison. Again, the Thunderbirds at a 2000. And the Blue Angels at a 2000. And again, the Blue Angels at 2000. Got a recurring theme here. I'm at a 4000. And you know, the, the, a lot of the times, the reason these shutter speeds are up so high is I'm going from uh, for example, with the Warbirds, I'm going from a propeller plane to a jet, and I'm just spinning the dial from slow shutter to fast shutter. And with the demonstration teams, 
uh, I'm often playing a little bit with, uh, with shutter speed. This is the Bretling team that I uh, showed you the plane and the uh, uh, Bentley a little bit earlier, um, the French civilian jet team. Here I'm at a 1600th. They're really not going all that fast in this formation. Uh, this is a Firecat demonstration team at a 3200th. Um, you, we'll talk a little bit more about where you want to position yourself on the flight line, hopefully. Uh, I think if you go to Cambrio this year, there's going to be pyrotechnics like this. And generally, those occur as close to the center line as possible. And I'll, again, talk a little bit more about, about the center line. Um, here you have the Ravens, which is a brilliant, uh, British civilian team that travels around the world, flying these little vans, RV-8s. Um, that shot at a hundredth of a second. And Southern California air shows that are coming up, uh, which of course have all been shut down through COVID for the last couple of years. Uh, in July, we have the, uh, excuse me, that should be August. Uh, we have the wings over Camarillo. And then in September was going to be the Miramar air show. And uh, a lot of my friends have not gotten the word until I mentioned it, that that show's actually been canceled. Uh, August 2nd and 3rd <clears throat> is the Great Pacific Air Show in Huntington Beach. It's kind of on my wish list. I used to go down and shoot the, uh, uh, the World Championship of Surfing down there. It was such a madhouse that when they started doing it, I quit going. When they started doing the Great Pacific Air Show, I really wanted to go, but uh, I might get the courage up one of these years to go. You know, the Blue Angels generally fly. Uh, they come across the pier at about 50 feet off the deck. And it's pretty exciting. It's just uh, dealing with the madness of the, uh, of the crowd there. Uh, October 23rd and 24th, the Los Angeles County Air Show is scheduled. That is my favorite air show. It's one I just will not miss, especially if they have the photo tour tickets available. Um, you know, it's out in the desert. The nice thing about LA County is that the airfield, your, your shooting position, you're shooting north with an east-west orientation. So it's perfect in terms of uh, light from early morning to late afternoon. You're never shooting into the sun. Uh, generally in the desert, you're getting a little breeze going. One of the problems at some of the air shows that we got demonstration teams is that they follow the aerobatics and the what have you, they're blowing smoke and it lingers in the air. It's terrible at Magoo. Uh, Magoo, the Magoo air show is uh, not my favorite at all because of the uh, a lot of problems they have, uh, mainly the, you know, it can be foggy, uh, you get the smoke hanging in the air, the blue angels start flying. You're not only flying, you're not only shooting through the atmospherics, you're also shooting straight into the sun late in the afternoon. So uh, Magoo's not my favorite. I'll go to it if they have it again, but not my favorite. And then uh, the 30th and 31st of October is uh, Flying Spain. <clears throat> excuse me, in Chino. And uh, that's, that's the big, big, maybe the biggest warbird show uh, on the west, west, western states. Um, it's, it's the granddaddy out here. So that's the air shows. Um, in terms of the Camrio show, because I think that's the one that everybody's looking forward to uh, <coughs> coming up. First, this is the layout that they are currently showing, which I kind of hope will change. I don't know. Um, the dilemma I have is this is about, I don't know if I can get the pointers on here. Uh, oh, there we go. Pointer. In the, in the past, the, the area for spectators went down almost to what would be the edge of my screen over here, maybe a little bit further. And they've really cut it back this year, which uh, I, I'm wondering where they're going to put everybody. Typically, in the past, this car show here has been down in this area here. And uh, a lot of the static displays uh, of airplanes have been over in this area. 
And you can see here, they're talking about uh, static airplanes in place in the, in the past. This has been where the experimentals and, uh, and some of the uh, aerobatics have been parked, but uh, that's changing up. Uh, here, they're gonna have static displays, which again, they've had in the past. The, there's, there's some controversy over where the best place to sit is on the flight line. Generally speaking, everything in the air show is geared around the center line of the show. When aerobatics perform, they have a marker, the center, mar center, center of the show. <clears throat> and everything performs around that center line. When you have pyrotechnics, everything happens at that center line. So the closer you can be to the center line, the better from that standpoint. From the standpoint of shooting, there's kind of two rules of thought. Uh, at Camarillo, the planes come from the east and sweep across the runway to the west. So some folks will say, you're better off down in this area because they're making their turn here and coming around and you might be able to get a better angle on them. The downside of that is that you have less time for that eye-hand coordination to spot the plane before it's coming by you. And if you're really good at that, maybe there is something to be said for being down in this area. These active movement areas are areas where they're bringing planes in and out during the show. So there is no seating allowed in, in those areas. The center line is always where the VIP chalet is. So that's gonna be the center of the show. So if they have pyrotechnics or they have activities like the parachuters will always, always aim to come down to the center line. So if you're down here, you're going to be shooting kind of backwards to it. Um, my theory and uh, that of a lot of the really good air show photographers I shoot with have always been to lean towards, if you can't get right at the center line, come down to an area down here, but that's not gonna be possible this year. So if you can get into this area here, I think that's the best bet for an angle on the show. That being said, you got the VIP tent here. So if you can't get in the front row, if you're back two or three rows, you may have your vision obscured from the standpoint of shooting down the flight line. I, I'm not sure about that. I won't know until I get out there, but it's something to think about in terms of whether you wanna be here or here. The advantage of shooting down in this area or further down the runway is that you have that much more time to get lined up, get the plane in your viewfinder, lock your focus, let the uh, um, servo take over and then you know, start shooting as it gets down in this area in here. Uh, you just have more time to do it. But again, you know, there's an argument for here. There's an argument for there. Uh, personally, I will be in the VIP chalet. If uh, you do decide to attend, then uh, I'll be probably hanging around here for a while in the morning if you have questions or what have you. But this is... Uh, uh, not, not a, this is not a um, TO photo group outing. Um, you are attending at your own risk, especially uh, given the recent uh, situation with COVID. I think everybody has to make their own decisions. So uh, I'm not going to be there as a uh, TO photo group uh, uh, leader, so to speak. Um, I'm will be out there just like all the rest of you asking each other questions and shooting together. So just with that caveat, I want to emphasize that, that, uh, I, you know, I, I'm, I'm just hoping the show will happen, but I think everybody has to make their own decision in terms of uh, risk and what have you with COVID in terms of, uh, of attending. Um, I will probably be wearing a mask the entire time. So that's the layout. They also have a little caveat when they show this map that uh, to refer back to it one week before the show or in the week prior to the show, because it is subject to change. 
So this may just be kind of a temporary holding place on the website. I don't know. Um, I'm kind of hoping that they will open up into the at least the areas that uh, traditionally uh, uh, they've had. Um, I'm going to put in the chat room, for those of you that have been furiously probably trying to take notes, I'm going to, if you want to stick around for a minute, I'm going to put in the chat room um, a PDF of all of my notes. And uh, let me see, I'll go do that right now. Uh, let's see. I know there is a way to... Did this the other day. How do you put an attachment in the? I have put attachments in before. It's not wanting to let me do that. Well, in that case, you want a copy of it? I'm putting my. Uh, there's my email address and uh, you can email me and I will send you a copy unless I can figure out tonight, maybe in a minute, how to uh, throw that up in the chat. Maybe it's not letting me do it while I've got the, uh, the program up. Uh, finally, I'm going to reduce this so I can see you guys again. And I'm going to go to my last screen here. <clears throat> there I, there we are. Any, and I'll open it up to any questions that anybody has. Uh...